Well, all through this summer sermon series, we've been gaining what it is to live out the Word of God through the book of Psalms. Summer in the Psalms. And on July 1st, I, I spoke on, on uh, or July closed, rather, I spoke on Psalm 1, and then all last month on Psalm 2, because Psalm 1 and 2 together form the introduction to the book of Psalms. They are the frame with, with, uh, of the context with, within the rest of the book sits. And next week, we begin a new series called Living the Dream, a study of the life of Joseph. And that means that today is my last opportunity to preach on the Psalms, and so I'm going to preach on my favorite song, because all when, when I left in July, I asked our special speakers, I, I said, we're going to preach on the Psalms, and they said, which psalm? I said, preach on your favorite song, and so they did that, and this is my opportunity to pre preach on my favorite psalm, and if you were here last week, you already know what it is, because I used it as the benediction at the close of the service. It's a psalm all about blessing, all about blessing, and we all like to be blessed, Amen. Amen. I didn't think I'd have to work you to get that amen from that one. So we all want to be blessed. We all appreciate blessing. And to be sure, we are blessed as a congregation. We have been blessed for 63 years. Kingston Alliance Church has gathered to praise and worship God, our Creator, God, our Savior, God, our Sanctifier, God, our Healer, and God, our coming King. And for 63 years, we've gathered once a week or more to hear the word of God, enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Spirit alive in each one of us who have called on his name. And the icing on the cake of late is to see the Lord blessing us, to see people taking steps of faith, to see the kingdom growing right in front of our eyes. And friends, opportunity to exercise your faith abounds. Moreover, we are blessed of God individually too. Amen? Amen. After all, God has given to us to, uh, who have called on Christ the new covenant through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Through his name, God has washed away our sins. He's cleansed us. He's made us free. He's forgiven us. He's given us hope. He's given us peace. He's given us the immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit alive in us. And so we have his peace and we have his presence and we have his power alive and working with us every single day of our lives from the time we make a commitment to Christ until the time we close our eyes and see his face. Praise the Lord. And to know such things is to know that God has blessed us and blessed us indeed. And this morning, as we consider God's blessing and his blessing upon us, we're going to ask a question. We're going to ask the question, why? Why has God blessed us? Why would God favor us so much? Because surely God, whoever goes about seeking his glory, also seeks it in blessing us. So, he, he's seeking it in giving us the profound blessings that he gives us, the blessings that we often take for granted every day. There's a reason why he has blessed us. And if we want to step into more of his blessing, we need to cooperate with him in that reason. We need to align ourselves with that reason. And today we're going to look at that reason. But before we open the word, let's always come before his throne in prayer. Father, now we're going to open our Bibles and we're going to look at what your word says. And every time we do that, Lord, it doesn't matter how many times we've read your word, you have something new for us. Every time your Holy Spirit lifts the, the text off the pages, applies them to the context of who we are, in the context of where we're living, in the context of what we're experiencing. And Lord, you do that for your purposes. And every time we see that, and every time you, we, we open our, ourselves to the Spirit, using your word in our lives, Father, we step forward into more blessing. Father, we want to do that today. So have your way with us, Lord. Here we are, gathered your people, and here you are, God Most High, our God. And Lord, as we open your word now, bless your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So open your Bibles if you brought them. There's a few bottle ahead of you if you didn't bring one or navigate in the device that you have as, a, as, a, uh, as it may be. We're going to look at Psalm 67 today. Psalm 67, a psalm of David about being blessed. And Psalm 67 is in the middle of the Bible, which is in the middle of the book of uh, the middle of the book of Psalms, which is in the middle of the Bible, so it's really easy to find. Psalm 67. 
And uh, you might have a different version ahead of you, but all through the summer series, I've been deliberately using different versions of the Scripture because I want to encourage you to look, look at and read different versions of the Scripture because we don't understand the original language, and we gain much by seeing how different uh, translators have parsed those words. And so today we're going to read together from the English Standard Version, the ESV. And let's stand together. It's a short psalm. Let's stand together and let's read. I'll put the words here on the screen behind us. Let's stand and read together if you're able. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Amen. Please be seated. Now, for most of us, if you've been coming to church for any period of time at all, you'll, you'll know that these words in Psalm 67 sound very familiar. And they don't just sound familiar because I used it as the benediction last week. You've probably heard these words before all th- ever since you've been coming to church, probably, because it echoes Numbers chapter 6. You might recall that back then, uh, the Lord had instructed Moses to instruct the high priest to bless his people. And they were to use these words. The high priest was to, was to bless the people of God using these words from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In fact, you've heard me use those words in benediction because it's a wonderful benediction. And we often use it in the evangelical church of Jesus Christ. But we often hear those words either in that form as a benediction at the close of a service, or we hear it in that beautiful worship song called The Blessing. And perhaps you heard that through the pandemic especially, a great song singing those words. But way back in Jewish history, as recorded for us in Numbers chapter 6, that blessing was given by God Most High to be given to the priest of God so that it could be received by the people of God is what we call the Aaronic blessing. That's A-A-R-O-N-I-C. It was given to Aaron, the high priest, and it was to be spoken by Aaron, the high priest. And so sometimes we call it the high priestly blessing. And God himself hinted at why he had instructed the high priest to so bless his people, because he said in Numbers 6, verse 27, he said, So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. And yet, in the psalm that we're reading today, King David wrote this psalm. And so we understand that King David uh, is, giving, is, is, is praying this. But King David is not a Levite. The high priest is supposed to be a Levite. They're supposed to be from the tribe of Levi. And King David was from the tribe of Judah. He's from the tribe of, from which Christ came, the tribe of Judah. And nevertheless, King David starts off this psalm with this very audacious ask. He comes before the Lord. He says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. And that's not a small thing to ask. It's, a, it's, it's really three different blessings. Really, if you think about it, if you look, look at the words there, the king asks for three audacious blessings for his people. Firstly, that God might be gracious to us. And the original language there, the ancient Hebrew there, means to have favor to show compassion, to provide, to take pity upon, to have mercy. And you might have heard the oft-quoted definition of grace as unmerited favor or undeserved mercy. You've probably heard that before. Many of you know exactly what grace is. You know what it is. You know what it is to ask for it, and you know what it is to receive it. And that's what we seek. We seek His grace in His mercy. But the word grace also means different things to different people at different times. And sometimes what we ask for by God's grace today is not what we ask for tomorrow. It's not what we asked for yesterday. It differs. 
For instance, normally farmers ask for God for his grace in the form of rain that the crops might grow. But if you've been reading the worldwide news, you know that just a few weeks ago, many in Mexico, many in California, many even in Quebec, God for grace to stop the rain. Because it just kept on raining and raining and raining. Even as those farmers in Alberta and those living in the North Earth Territories ask God for grace to stop the rain, in fact, or, or to send much more rain to stop the fires. And so grace means different things to different people in different seasons. But the biblical understanding of grace is unchanged. Even our, our perception of what it looks like flexes with our circumstance. In Leviticus 26, the Lord promised grace for his people. And he said, I will give you your rains in their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And that's why we want the rain, isn't it? It's not that we want to be wet. It's that we want the produce. We want the harvest. We want That's the real blessing. And God continues. He says, Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing. And you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. See, God knows what we want when we're asking for His grace. And that is the blessing of God's grace. It's grace to us when the sun and sky yield sun and rain in the right proportions and in the right seasons so that we might have an abundance. Because that's really what we're looking for. And we call that His common grace. Because He sends rain on the just and also on the unjust. And all of us here today and everybody watching at home are recipients of His common grace. Because we live in a land of much in the way of natural resources. In fact, by God's grace, our harvest every year is more than we can eat, and Canada exports train load after train load to the rest of the world that the rest of the world might also eat because we have His common grace. In fact, more than that, almost all of us here today are also recipients of His specific grace because to us it has been given to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everyone gets that. But to you and I, the gospel of Jesus Christ is faithfully preached in a language we understand week after week, year after year, for 63 years so far right here. And this is also His grace to us. Not just to hear it, but to pick it up and read it. Read it in a language that we understand. Some of you know the old hymn. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Does anybody know that? Am I the only one here? Oh, there's a few. There's a few. I remember singing that so often. But the grace of the cross is free for whosoever shall take it. It's grace that washes away our sins forever. Is grace that transports us out of darkness and into the kingdom of light. It is grace that gives us the right to be called children of God, though we were by nature his enemies. Yet he gives us this grace. He, become, he, he invites us to, to forgive, to be forgiven. He invites us to put our sins under the blood of Christ. He invites us to become heirs of the eternal kingdom of Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. This is a special grace because not every people group, my friends, not everybody in the world has heard the good news so far. But yet in his timing, in his grace, we get it. We already have it. We've had it for a long time. But not everybody has. In fact, that's the reason why we send out missionaries, international workers to the far flung corners of the globe. Because we have been given the grace to hear the gospel first. But not everybody has. And there's still 7,400 people groups live in this world who do not know even so much as the name of Jesus Christ, who do not have the opportunity to come to church week by week and hear of his grace, who do not have the opportunity to pick up a Bible whenever they want and read it, who do not have hymns and choruses speaking of his grace that they can easily commit to memory and worship along. They have not, they do not have that, but we do. So we have his common grace. And we have his special grace. And more than that, we even have his unusual grace, if you will. His extra special grace of his invitation to come alongside him in his work. 
in reaching the rest of the world. God invites us to be partners in sharing the good news of the gospel. And that's a holy and sacred grace indeed. But as though all of that grace, the common grace and the special grace and the extra special, as though all of that grace was not quite enough, the psalmist says, oh, but I also want blessing. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And the Hebrew there means to grant peace, security, safety, health, and strength. Consider the Levites who were told by God, I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred. A hundred of you shall chase ten thousand, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. God's blessing here is peace and security and safety because of his prevailing power through us. And praise the Lord, we've experienced at least some of that here in Canada because we have not fought a war on our own land since our founding. We have peace in our land. In fact, we have less violent crime and greater peace than almost every other nation on the globe. And Canada to this day is a great draw for the other nations. Many people around the world want to come here because of God's great grace to us. But you and I know many international workers. And we know many friends who come from lands that do not have that. Lands that have a long history of war. Lands like Afghanistan and Syria and Congo and South Sudan, where war and unrest have been a way of life. Lands like Ukraine and Yemen, where millions have to flee from their homes and are driven from their homes because of conflict. Lands like Cambodia, where an entire generation was wiped out in the killing fields. Lands like Venezuela and Lebanon, where lack and fighting over lack are endemic. Lands like China and Libya and Russia, North Korea, Laos, Pakistan, Egypt, and much of the Arabian Peninsula, where sudden arrest and undue imprisonment are fair game and daily reality. For many. We don't suffer any of that because of God's great grace to us. Here in Canada, we have His common grace, His special grace, His extra special grace, and His blessing. And we and God has blessed us. We have a fraction of the crime of most countries. And most of us have spent our whole lives living in Canada without knowing the ravages of war. In fact, that's actually why my parents came here in the 1950s. Because they wanted to live without war. They wanted to marry without war. They wanted to raise family without the horrors of the war that they lived through in Europe when they were little kids. We have peace as a country, and we have peace in our towns. We have God's blessing upon us. But civic peace, civic peace does not extend to the peace of mind that all of mankind seeks. And so it's of interest then that the psalmist says, well, don't forget that says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. And one commentator there says, the shining of God's face represents his favor onto life itself, much as the shining of the sun enables growth and harvest. And this too comes from the, Le the Levi Levite's blessing. Remember how God promised them, in Leviticus 26, he said, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old store long kept. You shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you. My soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. And who are we today? But the people of God. The people of God. In fact, that's the definition of the church. We're the called out people, the people that belong to him. And so we have received his grace. We've been blessed of him. We've been grafted into the people of God through faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. To know the shining of God's face upon them. And if you have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, if you believe that God raised him from the dead, then you are saved. And I want you to know that. Because you need to have a surety of that. You need to know that you're saved. That's why we ask those questions before we baptize someone. Because we want, to, we want them to know what, why they're doing that. 
So we interview them before bat. We don't just open that up to everybody. We say, wait, let me talk to you first. And we sit down and we ask some questions because we want to make sure people know that they're saved. It's important. And if you've called on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, then you are saved. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is yours. And God, God most high who dwells in heaven also dwells within you. And as Paul writes, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. And if the Spirit it dwells in you, then He will keep His covenant with you. And you are one of His people. Because praise the Lord, the face of God has shone upon you. Think about that. The face of God has shone upon you. You. And his face shines still. His face shines still. Even now, Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. He's praying for you right now as I preach. And if Christ has become your Savior, then Christ is even now your sanctifier. And Christ is your coming King. And one day, if not already, Christ will be your healer and restore you and give you a body without limitations. Praise the Lord. And so then, Day by day, His Spirit speaks to our spirit and He strengthens us through whatever struggle we have to for His purposes. And as we look to Him, we grow spiritually because God still shines His face upon us. Praise the Lord. And so the grace that the psalmist asks for and the grace we pray for are already ours. And the blessing the psalmist asks for and the blessing we pray for are already ours. And best of all, God has shone His face upon us, given us peace with Him, peace with others. And above all that, everything that could be construed a blessing is already ours in Christ because Scripture says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why? Why? You ever ask that question? Why would God do all that for us? Grace, blessing, the shining of His face upon us. Why? Is it because we're just so lovable? Is it that we might simply revel in all that He's pouring out upon us, that we might rejoice in Him, that we might rejoice among each other, that we might just enjoy all of this for ourselves. Friends, some think so, and many act so, in God's kingdom globally. But that's not why. You know, I mentioned that my parents came to Canada from Europe before I was born. And they arrived with basically nothing. And they lacked the resources to go back and forth across the ocean. And as a result, I didn't see my grandparents that much. But I do have memories of the two times that my mom's mom came to Canada to visit us way back when I was a little kid. And one of the clearest memories I have of her was when we were visiting my aunt's place out in the country. And if my memory serves right, that country place was in, I think, in Brockville. And we lived in Scarborough, so it was a long way away. And we drove out there. And it was the country. There was, there was big fields, which I'd not seen before. And my mom's mom was there, my grandmother. But I was only four or five, and so myself and my two brothers, my one older brother, my one younger brother, you know, we were kind of running around, you know, rug rats, if you will. And so we got sent out to play in the big field behind the house. And so we ran out there, and we had a great time playing hide-and-seek and doing all sorts of things with all sorts of trees and places to hide, trees to climb, lots of things to see and do. And so we were out there doing that, enjoying that, being out in the country. And while we were outside enjoying all that, someone brought in, as a special treat, a box of donuts. And at the time, I must have been nearby. Because I heard my aunt calling, and I went inside. Because someone said, hey, come on, come on, there's something here for you. And my younger brother, Clark, joined us. But for whatever reason, my older brother, David, was further away, and he didn't hear. So we were there. And, well, when we came in, my grandmother looked at the two of us, and knowing full well there's three of us, she gave me two donuts. Now, no words were said, to be fair. But I, I kind of knew, even though I was really little, that I was supposed to give one of those donuts to 
my older brother. But he wasn't there. And so I was told to go outside. And uh, they expected me, I'm sure, to give it to him. So I went outside and I went to a place where I knew he was not. And I said his name very quietly under my breath. I said, David, David. And when he didn't magically appear, I concluded that this donut's probably going to go bad if I wait too long. Nobody wants a donut to go bad. And rather than risk it spoiling, I thought I should just eat it because that would be a better thing than let, letting it spoil, right? And so I ate both donuts that were given to me. True story. Of course, you can anticipate that while well, I got the second donut, after my parents found out what I had done, I really, I really got it. If you know what I mean. And that's because the point of the overabundant blessing of the second donut was not that I should gorge myself. And we get that, right? Not just a childhood memory of a childish act, but the simple point of that story is the same as the point of this song. Because the point of all that God has blessed us with, his grace and his peace and himself, is not that we should hoard such blessing to ourselves, but that we might share the blessing of God with others. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that, or one might read, so that your way may be known on earth, your saving power, and read it there. Read it there in verse 2 for yourself. Among all nations. And here's a Bible study tip for you, because when you're reading the scriptures and you come across a clause like that says that or so that, anytime you read of God telling you why, you need to pay special attention because God is God. He does not have to tip his hand to us. He doesn't have a he doesn't owe us a reason why. He doesn't need to do that. You know, when the king makes a choice, the king makes a choice. He's the king. He's sovereign. He doesn't say, I made this choice, and let me tell you why this choice is important and why I had to make this choice. The king doesn't owe you that. They're the king. He says, this is the choice I made, and that's it. And so when God gives us a why, it's because he really wants us to grasp it. He really wants us to grasp it. John R. Scott explains the motive of the psalmist and his in these words, he says, they prayed that God would bless them, not in order to wallow comfortably in his blessings, but that they might pass from him to others. That they would pass from him to others, so that his ways might be known on earth, so that his salvation might be known among all nations. And I want us to look carefully now at the language the psalmist uses, because you've got to understand, the psalmist was a Jew, a descendant of Abraham, Look at those words. So that your way may be known on earth, the whole globe, your saving power among all nations, not just Israel. Let the peoples, that was, was a plural there, praise you, O God. Not just Israel praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations, not just Israel, all of them, be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples, the whole number of them, every people group, with equity, and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Over and over and over again, it's, it's, it's reinforced here. And this is remarkable because when God blessed Abraham, remember what he said. He said, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth, meaning everybody. Everybody, the whole earth. And Psalm 67 is, in that way, a very real restatement of the Abrahamic blessing. And the point of that blessing, and the point of Israel itself, really then, was to demonstrate God's kingdom to a lost world. To demonstrate Him and His ways to a lost world. To demonstrate that the blessing flows out of obedience and to speak of all that God had done for them and increase God's great glory. And they were blessed of God so that they would have all they need to be a witness for God Most High through action and through word and through circumstance. And you know what? 
Shortly after David penned those words in Psalm 67, they were. They really were, for a little season at least. Because if you read the book of 1 Kings, you see that chapters 3 to 10 of 1 Kings gives us a historical account of how God began fulfilling his promise to Abraham, how God began answering King David's prayer here in Psalm 67. And 1 Kings 10, 23 of 24, speaks of David's son just one generation after David penned Psalm 67. It says, Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom, and the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Why did they seek him? Well, they sought him because the, the grace of God and the blessing of God and the shining of God's face was upon Israel and was upon Israel's king. And Solomon had a great abundance of everything, even wisdom. And so all the nations said, wow, look what they have. I want what they have. How do I get what they have? And so they came and they said, hey, how, do you, how, do you, how did it come about that you have all that? And so they, they, all the nations looked to Israel to understand how it is that they were so blessed. But you know, at the apex of their, of their glory, Israel forgot why. They forgot. They forgot why. And 1 Kings 10 ends with a note about Solomon's hoarding of all manner of wealth, about Solomon's hoarding of chariots and horsemen. And as the next chapter starts, Solomon starts hoarding and accumulating wives even though God had specifically said in Deuteronomy 17, the king must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. That was the command of God for the ruler of Israel, because God knew if you get too much, if you think it's all just for you, you're going to start to hoard it. And Solomon, though he was wise, and though he had the word of God, listen carefully now, he did not love the Lord his God with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, and all of his strength. He did not. He probably knew he should, but he did not. And because of that, Solomon forgot why God had blessed him and his countrymen so greatly, so abundantly. And friend, by the time you get to the end of 1 Kings chapter 11, you find Solomon is dead, civil wars erupted, and the country's long spiral downhill has begun. And you know, sadly, it's a spiral that Abraham's descendants had seen before. They had experienced it before. And someday when you have a lot of extra time on your hands, you can study the similarities between the book of Judges and the book of 1 and 2 Kings. Because Solomon had plenty of warning from his history about this exact phenomena, and nevertheless, he forgot the point. He forgot the point of being blessed as God's people, and friend, there is a terrible price in forgetting the point. There's a terrible price to pay for forgetting the point. And it's not like it's hard to remember. The point even a child can understand. We are blessed to be a blessing. And may... And we should know that. We're made in His image so that we can reflect Him. So we can reflect Him. So we ought to reflect His character and we ought to reflect His purpose. We ought to reflect something of Him all the time. And we ought to be being then about His mission of increasing His glory to all peoples. Those God sends to us and those God sends us to. We ought to be using the blessing He gives us for the reason He gives it to us to start with. And if the incarnation of Christ, and if the sending of the Spirit, and if the fellowship of the church teaches us anything, is that God is going about restoring the people He's made. He's going about declaring His kingdom. He's going about demonstrating His kingdom. He's going about doing exactly what He was doing when He called Abraham, and exactly what He was doing when He when he called David, exactly what he was doing when he blessed Solomon to begin with, exactly what he was doing when he sent Christ, who did exactly those things and sent a spirit to help us do those very things. The point. Friends, the mission of God is to bring the blessing of himself, the blessing of himself to fallen mankind. And if you read the whole Bible, by the time you get to the end, you realize that. God is coming here. Why? To bring the blessing of Himself here. 
It was about blessing with himself. That's exactly what he was doing with Israel. And since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's what he's been doing with his global church. It's what he intends to do with your life, with my life, with all of us. Not just with us as a congregation, but also with us as individually. All who call upon his name are to be part of his global purpose. All who call upon his name are blessed so they can be a blessing. And all he saves from Canada and all he saves from the foreign mission fields of the world, that's exactly what he is doing, what he was doing, and what he purposes to do with every single one of us. If only we get the point. If only we get the point. That we might declare his kingdom through the proclamation of his gospel to all our neighbors. That we might demonstrate his kingdom through care for the poor all around us. That we might minister for his glory to all people, those near us and those far from us. That his name would be honored, that nations would fear him, and that all the ends of the earth would hold the name of Jesus Christ, and God our Father, in reverent fear. That's the goal of the blessing. We're blessed so that we might bring the blessing of him to all those around us. That and nothing less than that. And I hope you get the personal implication. Commentator W. Jones said, a living, active, holy church would speedily result in the conversion of the world to God. What the church most pressingly needs for the accomplishment of of the great work is not more numerous agencies, not new methods of evangelism, not even necessarily increased material wealth, but a deeper and more binding realization of the presence and blessing of God in her midst. We need to understand we have God and we have all the blessings of God for this very purpose. For His purpose. Not for our purpose. Not that we might gorge ourselves on a second donut per se. And friends, everything we've ever had and everything we have now and everything we ever will have is because of God's blessing on us. But we are really create creatures. We are the created. He is the creator. It is he who formed us. It is he who gives us ability. It is he who sets us where we're born. It is he who gives us our birth family. It is he who sets us in the community that we find ourselves among today. It is he who gives us breath and strength to grasp the circumstances of our lives. And it is he who gives us himself. He gives us himself in Christ who died to cleanse us from our sin. He gives us himself in the church, in the body of Jesus Christ our Lord, that we might be brothers and sisters in Christ. He gives us himself in his Holy Spirit, through the Spirit's leading, through the Spirit's guiding, through the Spirit's gifting. And all we've ever had, and all we are today, and all we ever will have, and himself three times over, so that we might be about his purpose of bringing the blessing of himself to others. That is why. That is why, as the late, great Don Richardson put it, we are blessed to be a blessing. Blessed that we might bless others with him, with something of him. In every conversation, whether that's a long, protracted conversation over 75 years of of knowing a spouse, or whether that's a short conversation at the end of a checkout counter, that they might experience something of him some kind word, some grace, some compassion, that they might have some of his peace. That everywhere we go, people would say, I I want what that person has. I see something, something that's not of this world in them. That's the point. So how are we going to go about doing that? Well, friends, a sermon without application is just a TED Talk. And I don't want to give you TED Talks. You can Google those. So I want to give you three applications, three ways we can partner with God in this season of our lives to apply this. Three ways we can bless other people right here, right now, with who we are and with what we have. Firstly, I want to encourage you to participate in Alpha this fall. Alpha is run all across the world. It's run in dozens of languages. It's a highly successful and tested program. And right here at KC, we're going to run an Alpha course on Sunday nights starting right after Thanksgiving. October 15th will be our first session. So begin now by setting aside those Sunday nights to participate. Talk to me if you want to join the Alpha team. 
If you want to be part of a team that's helping put this on, we need all sorts of volunteers for that. Start prayer walking your neighborhood, asking God who he would have you to invite. Because we don't just want you to come to Alpha so you can experience that. You already have the blessing of God. No, we want you to bring someone else to Alpha. And God has put people in your circles of influence for this reason, that they might know him. That they might know him. And if you don't, can't think of a name, you know what? You start prayer walking your neighborhood, God will give you someone. Because he's actually, he's actually pretty much on board with this program. <laughs> it's his idea, after all. So consider who you would invite to Alpha, and then invite them. And if you're living here in the Kingston area, start coming on October 15th, and come and sit with them as we talk over coffee and dessert, as we watch a 20-minute video, and then talk about the questions that that video raises, about the big questions of life, and the blessing of God that it presents. That's one way to participate. Secondly, you can participate in any one of almost innumerable other outreach ministries. We run Storehouse of Hope here on Monday, starting September 11th. We run Awana on, thir on Tuesday evening, starting September 12th. If you're a senior, you can invite them to Evergreen on the first Wednesday of the month, starting October 4th. And here at KC, we are committed to using all that we have, especially this building, toward the point. And if you cannot help us here, then help, help promote the mission of Jesus Christ through some other community ministry that's all about bringing the blessing of God to others. And there's lots of them. Bridges Kingston, for instance. Lionhearts. There's many, many, many ways to participate. And if you have limitation in time and limitation in mobility, well, you can always pray for the point. The prayer is the real work of the kingdom. It really is. One of the reasons we're going to have the Alpha team meet once a week through September is because we really need to pray into it. If there's not prayer, there won't be any fruit. So pray into things. You, from wherever you are, you can pray for the lost around you. From wherever you are, you can pray for those who are reaching the lost nations of the world. And with whatever you have, you can support both of those causes. Those who are seeking to save the unsaved and those who are seeking to reach the unreached. But let us not forget the point. We are blessed to be a blessing. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, you have blessed us greatly. You have blessed us very abundantly. Lord, <laughs> we're almost at a loss when we think of all the ways you've blessed us. But you have blessed us for this purpose, Lord. You have blessed us to be a blessing, to bring Christ to someone else, to expand your glory and your kingdom, to be witnesses of you every single day that we have breath. So in some way, Lord God, let us reflect you. Let us leave this place and shine forth your glory that this world would know as long as we have breath, there's a God in heaven who has saved us because of the work of Christ on the cross long ago and who this day is still in the business of saving, restoring, and redeeming his people. Father, we give you praise on account of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship.